Thank you, KJ. And thank you, Branch Community Church, for hosting me and for the C.S. Lewis Institute as well. I'm so pleased to work with the C.S. Lewis Institute. I think that discipleship is so deeply needed in the North American church. And so it's very moving to me to be able to be involved with the C.S. Lewis Institute and with those efforts. But it's great to see all of you. And I really do love this town. It's been a while since I've been to Chicago. Do, does anybody else say shy town here? Or is that one of those? Yeah, see, so I thought so. So I'm from Atlanta area. And in Atlanta, nobody would ever say hot Atlanta. But outside of Atlanta, everybody calls it hot Atlanta. So I think I walked into one of those situations there. But it's wonderful to see you all. So this is a topic that's very close to my heart as well. So I, am an evangelical, I'm, I have an evangelical background. My father, Stuart McAllister, was at one point the general secretary of the European Evangelical Alliance. And so I was born and raised in Vienna, Austria. Now I think this is a cosmopolitan group, and I don't need to stress this with all of you, but I did say Austria and not Australia. For a long time, people kept mishearing me, and they wondered where my sexy accent was and whether I had kangaroos and koala bears in my backyard. But we are talking about the place where the hills were alive with the sound of music. That's where I was from. That's where I lived. And I moved to the States when I was 14 years old. And so this is a topic, I've, I mean, evangelicalism, this is, I grew up in, these, in this community, and to a significant degree, these are my people. <clears throat> But I thought, in recent years, the beginning of Mark Knowles' great book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, which is, I think, just had its 30-year anniversary or something like that. But in that book, he says, I have a lover's quarrel with evangelicalism. And I like that phrase, lover's quarrel, because that is how I have felt in recent years. What is going on right now? Why are we having a conversation like this right now? What we're seeing is, to a significant, to a significant degree, breakdown over very serious moral failure. Every single week, it seems, we hear another story, we see another scandal, and this causes serious cognitive dissonance. And this causes serious questions, and they're important questions. And so I think this is a very important conversation, and I'm really grateful that we're having it, and I don't take for granted that we're having it in a church willing to engage this topic. So let's, let's be grateful for that. Thinker I really like is Blaise Pascal. Pascal was a whiz. He never actually published the Pensees. And the Pensees, of, of course, loosely translated from the French, that translates to thoughts. And these were the jottings of an absolute whiz. Pascal was a polymath. He was a mathematician. He actually invented the prototype of what would be a computer as well. But these jottings are absolutely fascinating and thrilling. It's funny, the philosopher Peter Kraft says, it's probably a good thing that the Ponces were never published because then they would have been systematized and they would have been made really boring and kind of dry and academic. And instead you get these raw sparks, these exciting thoughts. But here's a thought from Pascal that sounds a little cryptic at first, but I think is really powerful. The motions of grace the hardness of the heart, external circumstances. What on earth does that mean? The motions of grace, the hardness of the heart, external circumstances. Well, because I am a Christian and I speak from that standpoint, I think this describes the three major dimensions of how we come at reality. There are the motions of grace God is actively at work sustaining his world. 
I think of Paul's wonderful words in Colossians. In Christ, all things hold together. But then there's the hardness of the human heart. Sin, brokenness, and fallenness that obscures our vision of the motions of grace. And we often don't see it. And then at the very end, we have external circumstances. History, culture, which cultures come and go, movements come and go, fads come and go. History, in many ways, if we look at it simply on its own, can be a very barren and bleak wasteland because we're just seeing the external circumstances. And we can look to the book of Ecclesiastes for a very honest survey of that landscape. All is vanity. Because it's all meaningless? No, but because it's passing away. It's shot through with impermanence. George Marsden, in his book, Fundamentalism and American Culture, talks about He says, the task of the theologian is to use scriptural criteria to look at history and determine what the genuine acts of the Holy Spirit are. And he says that Christian historians perform something that's a a task, a service that's a little bit different but complementary. They, for the most part, restrict their judgments and look mainly at cultural factors and those external circumstances so that when we read their work, we can do the discerning work of looking to see where the work of God happens and where the passing fads and trends of culture simply are moving along to make that crucial distinction between the work of God and the culture that is passing away. That's the task at hand. And I think, friends, at the heart of this discussion, we're going to use words like deconstructing, and don't worry, we will define our terms. At the heart of this discussion is the miracle, the scandal, that the Word became flesh, that Christ stepped into history into historical circumstances with all of their passing fancies and cultural trends. That is absolutely remarkable, and it has some major ramifications. And, as KJ said earlier, the church, humble and messed up as she often is, is God's A plan for the evangelization of the world. So it's through specific human beings that Christ's work is carried on in this world. That is absolutely amazing. That you are a person, a moral agent on a historical stage, and your actions aren't just passing away in the wind, but they carry true significance. That's what we're really discussing here. So I want to use Pascal's, the motions of grace, the hardness of the heart, external circumstances, but I don't know about you, but I am a spiritual blockhead. So I can't start with the motions of grace. I'm hard of hearing. I'm going to start with external circumstances. We're going to take Pascal and we're going to go in reverse. We will begin with external circumstances, with the world as we know it, with what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame, what we see. We'll begin with external circumstances. Then we'll talk about the hardness of the heart. I'm really good on the hardness of the heart, by the way. I'm an authority on the, on the hardness of the heart because all I have to do is look in the mirror to confirm the hardness of the heart. I have two little children, and they confirm it for me every day, free of charge, hardness of the heart. I'm really good on that one. And then we will finally conclude with the motions of grace. And I will do my very best to try to convey that faithfully. And then we'll have a Q&A. External circumstances, where we are. Deconstructing. What do we mean by deconstructing? First of all, let's make a key distinction. Deconstructing is not the same thing as deconstructionism. We are not going to be talking about deconstructionism. Deconstructionism is part of French theory. 
And you will probably find the most detailed exploration in Jacques Derrida's of grammatology. And so that is a literary and philosophical technique, and that is distinct from deconstructing. So what do we mean by deconstructing, especially as it's applied to evangelicalism? Well, deconstructing as it's used now, it's been adapted and kind of gained some wide currency. It's got some fluid and some dynamic factors to it and features to it. So I can't give you a totally definitive definition, but I think we can isolate some key features. So by deconstructing, I mean a critical re-examination of the historical underpinnings of one's particular faith tradition. I'll repeat it. But I think that this is basically what's going on in most of the deconstructing conversations. It's a critical re-examination of the historical underpinnings of one's particular faith tradition. It's a re-examination because it's often occasioned by a crisis, a moral failure, hurt in the church, something has gone very wrong. And so the information that the person has received up to this point, they are now beginning to question it for very good reason. We, have all, we, we need to have a lot of sympathy and a lot of compassion here, I'm going to suggest to you. But it is a re-examination. Also, very important to bear in mind, the trajectories here are very diverse. For some people, this, is, this represents kind of a step in deepening the faith. This is a step toward a more mature faith. For others, this means maybe moving to another faith tradition, maybe Catholicism, maybe more high church. For others, it means walking away from the church entire, entirely for a season and for a time. So part of that is, that's, that those are some of the fluid and the dynamic aspects to that. But I think most of these conversations center on history, specifically as it's applied to one's own particular faith tradition. Now, evangelicalism has been under fire recently for very good reason. Again, many scandals. Also, 2016 was a major watershed moment, and it wasn't just about politics. It really wasn't. It had to do with the very nature of the convictions that have been preached for so long. And I'm not making any partisan comments here, but that was a moment where the plausibility structure of evangelicalism faced some severe challenges. So now we've come to evangelicalism. So here's a really thorny problem. Define evangelicalism. One definition of an evangelical that I like is, an evangelical is somebody who likes to argue about the definition of evangelicalism. <laughs> but over the years, there is one definition that's become semi-canonical, and this comes from the Scottish historian David Bebbington. And it is known as the famous quadrilateral. Famous is a relative term, obviously, right? <laughs> Ever heard of the quadrilateral? But the quadrilateral, it's four points of emphasis. And David Bebbington maintains that these really characterize evangelicalism, and I think that this is a pretty good overall survey. So they are, number one, scripturalism. Two, conversionism. Three, Crusocentrism and four, activism. I'll go through these each. But the Bible, the cross, your story, that's your testimony, and the good news, activism, evangelism. And that these four points of emphasis really characterize the evangelical movement in its historical presentations. And I think if you look at the history of the movement over the years, you'll find this to be true. These four points of emphasis really do tie this all together. And it's been, now we're going to talk a little bit about what has happened as evangelicalism has made it to North American shores. Because in the United States, the relationship of Christianity is a very unique, but also a very strange one. This is a very religiously strange nation. When I'm, and let me, let me 
Let me draw on my missionary kid background to, to sort of illustrate this real quickly. When I moved to the States, I was 14 years old, and I came, as I said, I came from Vienna, Austria. Austria is a nominally Catholic nation, but Austria is secular, and it is truly post-Christian. And it's not aggressively post-Christian. When you're actually in a truly post-Christian environment, you'll find that being a Christian simply makes you a cultural anomaly. The vocabulary of Christianity has all been forgotten. And it's kind of a haunting experience, too. In Austria, there are beautiful, magnificent cathedrals. There's St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. But it's not a house of worship anymore. It's more of a museum. And people will wander through there like tourists with cameras, taking pictures of all these strange relics, the strange scenes in the stained glass windows, the altar. Some people will still take the time to cross themselves with the holy water, but it's just kind of a gesture for most of them. So it's a haunting experience. But I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, the Bible Belt South, and everybody is a Christian. No matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter who they do it with, everybody is a Christian. They could have had a voodoo shrine in their living room and still led worship at the Baptist church up the street. <laughs> slightly exaggerated, but only slightly. Now, this was very strange for me because, I, again, I came from an environment where you either are a Christian or you are not. And suddenly I'm encountering cultural Christianity. What is that? It was something I didn't understand. I had never seen it before. Because it wasn't possible in the environment I was in. It is possible in the United States. And this is part of the challenge that we faced as an evangelical church. Because on the one hand, we've had inroads into the culture... And that's allowed us to have some tremendous influence. But, may I suggest to you, in our well-intentioned efforts, we have underestimated the seductive nature of cultural influence. What we need to be pressing into is faithfulness, courageous faithfulness, even if it means we lose on a cultural level. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to talk about something that runs the risk of sounding a little abstract here, but it is a very important factor. So Mark Knoll wrote a book called America's God, and it is a challenging book. It's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy scholarly book, but I think it's a very helpful exposition of the church in North America. And he talks about this strange concoction called the American synthesis. Doesn't that just sound thrilling? You're really excited. You brave traffic to hear about the American synthesis, aren't you? I'll try to make it worth your while. The American synthesis is the interesting and unique blend that Christianity is in North America. It's a blend of Christianity, but also republicanism, common sense philosophy, and the Scottish Enlightenment. Very interesting elements. And republicanism, by the way, me meaning main mainly the over overall political philosophy of liberty and the pursuit of liberty. It's tough to get an actual definitive definition there, but most people are agreed that it's, it is very anti-state church. So very, very for liberty and justice and the pursuit of dream, of the American dream. But common sense philosophy and pragmatism are two real big factors here. Now, from a historical standpoint, this is a bit of an anomaly because this switch happens very quickly, and Mark Knoll really stresses this. Why is this an anomaly? Well, who are the people who show up at Plymouth Rock? They're Puritans. They're pilgrims, right? And their theology is pretty harsh when it comes to the fallenness and the depravity of human beings, right? Very down, very, I mean, very, very big on the wretchedness of human beings. But that doesn't, 
That doesn't play so well when you're trying to come up with a feasible kind of political philosophy that will tie a society together and promote sort of cooperation. And so the Scottish Enlightenment, figures like Francis Rutherford, Adam Smith, and Thomas Reed. Thomas Reed is a really big, is a really big guy. The Scottish Enlightenment comes in very handy here. This is different from the radical enlightenment or the skeptical enlightenment. The skeptical enlightenment figures like Voltaire. The radical enlightenment are figures like Rousseau, revolutionaries, all of that scary stuff. But this, this is sometimes called the didactic enlightenment or the moral enlightenment. And essentially, what is being said here is that, no, 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 no. I mean, yes, sin is a factor, absolutely, but... All of us are responsible, reasonable human beings, and we have within ourselves all the tools that we need to make genuine moral discoveries, and we can be moral people. As long as we're resourceful and innovative, we can do this, and we don't need to worry so much about depravity. And so some of the key elements of what make the United States such a formidable country here are already coming together a real spirit of innovation, a real spirit of pressing forward, and resourcefulness. One of the most famous American essays comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it is called Self-Reliance. We're all about being resourceful, and we're energetic, and we're innovative. What we often lack, though, is a full view of history. See, history keeps coming back into this conversation. And the United States is a nation where history has not always been highly prized. We're a nation with, without a strong sense of historical consciousness as a major value, partly because we're so young. Let me give you a quote that you may never have heard, but it's in the DNA of this nation. I happen to believe that the poets, the songwriters, the people who are really shaping the imagination have a way of getting into our hearts like no others. And this is Ralph Waldo Emerson again, and he says, History is an impertinence and an injury if it be anything more than a cheerful apologue or parable of my own being and becoming. History is an impertinence and an injury if it be anything more than a cheerful apologue or parable of my own being and becoming. An apologue is a moral parable. Now that's a poetic way of saying all of the contingent factors that brought me to where I am, my family, the teachers, my friends, the community that formed and shaped me, all of that is completely secondary to my own pursuit of who I want to be, my own being and becoming. Now, we are living in the shadow of that quotation today. We really are. Here's here's an interesting little fact. What was the title of the memoir of former First Lady Michelle Obama? Remember what it's called? Becoming that favorite American pastime. And if you dip into that book, she talks about, essentially, it's really about, you've probably seen this quotation before, it's the journey, not the destination. It's all about becoming. It's all about pressing forward, looking forward to the next big thing. And see that ahistorical outlook carries a price. It really does. Mark Knoll once, when he was on a panel, and they were talking about, they were celebrating, I think this was the 20th anniversary of the scandal of the evangelical mind. He obviously made an impact with this book, and they were asking him, 20 years later, what do you think now about evangelicalism? How, how have we fared in the years since then? And he said, Well, obviously, there's been a flurry of scholarly activity, 
We've had, there's research journals, there's the Evangelical Philosophical Society, there's the Evangelical Theological Society. But because evangelicalism is so, so stresses activism and evangelism, which is a good thing, we tend to always rush into activity and we tend not to be as reflective about it. We rush headlong into the next activity. Look at this new exciting venture. Look at this new trend. Look at this new platform. Let's leverage it. Let's, a favorite evangelical word, let's engage it. Engage with this and get the world to listen because we care. And again, wonderful, wonderful energy there. But also, are we thinking carefully about what we're doing? Are we meeting the world on Christ's terms rather than its own terms. It's possible to do that, to engage and to get excited and to throw yourself into culture when things are relatively stable. But when you reach a point of cultural crisis where there's serious disintegration, where there is serious breakdown, that's when you're faced with a question of, do I go with convenience and expediency, or do I stand firm on my convictions for Christ and lose well in cultural terms? We don't like to hear that, but that's how we have to start thinking. Let's talk about the hardness of the heart. Let's talk about the hardness of the evangelical heart, if I can speak an impossibly broad terms. So let's go back to that quadrilateral. Of those four, I think there, there are two that are in serious need of some resuscitation. The authority of Scripture in evangelical circles, I think we're good on the authority of Scripture. I think there's wonderful scholarship there. I think there are very serious questions. There always will be, but I think we are good there. I think it's taken seriously. I think it's emphasized. I think we're good there. When it comes to activism, I think we're good. We are an energetic, zealous, active bunch, and I think we are involved, and I think we care, and I think you see a lot of wonderful activity. The two that need resuscitation, conversion, and the cross, these two. Let's start with conversion, your story. This is the way this is often said. I love this. In evangelical circles, we love to tell each other our stories or your testimony. The more crazy and the more exciting, the better sometimes, right? If you have a boring testimony, then that can be a bit of a challenge, and sometimes you, you feel the need to almost embellish a little bit. But the story, I love the story aspect. Tell me your story. I'll tell you my story. It's great. So my dad has a very interesting story. He's got an exotic testimony. And if my book is here, and if you look into that book, you can hear a little bit about what dad came from. But he told me when I was probably about seven years old, he would tell me a series of stories and sit on my bed every night, and he would tell me these stories about this very bad man, this villain. Villains are just so deliciously interesting, are they not? They always are. They have a problem. They, they have a way of getting away from the story and becoming more compelling than the hero sometimes. This is the Milton Satan problem. You've probably heard this if you've ever read Paradise Lost. And the problem with Paradise Lost is that the most compelling, interesting, and forceful character in there is Satan. And in recent years, if you saw The Dark Knight, the Joker kind of gets away there a little bit too and ends up being a very compelling, interesting character. Well, this character was very interesting. He was very dangerous. He was a criminal. He was very strong, and he used his strength against others. And you'll see where this is going immediately, some of you. My dad told me this in a series, and eventually this, this comes to the conclusion, and my dad looks at me and he says, son, that bad man was me. And it was a very surreal moment because I truly could not do the mental math and reconcile this loving dad at the foot of my bed with this villain I had in my mind. Couldn't be the same person. 
I was right. It wasn't. I didn't have a vocabulary for this at this point. I didn't have a theological degree or anything like that, but what I was observing firsthand was transformation. Oh, my dad had been converted, and he had completely turned around. He had changed his whole way of living and being and doing. Everything about him was different. That is what we need to address in part here in our North American churches. And I say this with love because we have come to a point where we have often divorced belief from obedience. There's a mindset here, and in the book I call this information saves. And I think it's kind of a self-evident phrase, too. Get the right training. Listen to the right podcasts. Go to the right conferences. Listen to the right speakers. Read the right books. Get all the worldview training. I'm not disparaging any of these resources, by the way. Thank God for them. When it comes to information, when it comes to wonderful resources, we've got an embarrassment of riches. So what's wrong? Accuracy of what you're able to recite doesn't necessarily translate to your behavior. We're forgetting that when we're talking to human beings, when we're dealing with human beings, we are dealing with the heart. In the full sense, the heart is the core of who you are. Dallas Willard has a wonderfully inelegant definition of the heart, but it's so practically helpful. The heart, says Willard, is the executive center of the self. And there's often a pronounced discrepancy between the heart and the mind. Because if you ask people what they think, they will tell you all sorts of things. If you ask me what I think, I'll tell you all sorts of things. If you ask me about certain dietary factors, you know, I'll tell you all sorts of things about what I shouldn't be eating, what I would, shouldn't be doing. But if you look at what I'm actually doing, <laughs> if you look at my fridge or if you look at my exercise routine, you're often going to see a very different story. For years, I was a smoker. Let me ask you this. Is the problem with smoking a lack of information? <laughs> oh, it's on the pack. <laughs> it is confirmed. You know, it is filed away. It is done. And yet, was it just because I was reckless and a lunatic? Maybe somewhat. But we have deeper driving impulses. We're more complex than that. And we have not focused on the will. We have looked at conversion in too instrumental of a fashion. As a quick, one-time, make sure you get all the right information, make sure you pass the test, and now you're good. Rather than looking holistically at the whole person, your whole life has to change. And that will come with a cost. What does Jesus say to us? What does our Lord say to us? He who wishes to save his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall gain it. So here we come to the cross. We stress the cross when it comes to emphasizing the cross as in saying the cross is important and making it central and seeing crosses everywhere. We certainly stress the cross, but when it comes to taking up our cross... That's where we struggle. We are called to take up our cross. Now, we can't do this on our own strength. You really can't. When Jesus was asked about the two greatest, when, when he was asked about the greatest commandment, he gave a bonus answer. He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So with your whole person, everything, every, your, the whole shape of your life should reflect that. That's what conversion means in its fullest sense. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that sequence is absolutely crucial. 
I'm going to suggest to you that you cannot possibly love anybody as yourself unless you have first given yourself completely to Christ. We are told that we love because He first loved us. It's His love that inaugurates that ability in us. But we need to come to the feet of Christ and we need to learn to take up our cross and live self-sacrificially. These two points of emphasis are beautiful, but we have to recover a full-bodied, robust understanding of what it means to turn away from the world as it is and follow Christ and take up our cross as we do so. So finally, we come to the motions of grace. I want to look at John chapter 18. This is an amazing episode. This is where Jesus finds himself before Pilate. And he's being grilled by Pilate because Pilate has an unruly mob in his courtyard and he's getting increasingly nervous about the political ramifications of the situation that's unfolding here. And so he wants to ask Jesus questions about why he's being accused and why these people want to execute him. And Jesus keeps giving very mystical and what appear to be very evasive answers. And this will show us, I think, a little bit of the intersection of the motions of grace, the hardness of the heart, and external circumstances. So starting in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world." Then Pilate said to him, So, you're a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And here's the famous line. Pilate said to him, What is truth? There's a lot of attention that's paid to the irony of that statement. Because, again, if you're a Christian, Christ is truth, and Pilate is asking this question in the very presence of the one who is the truth. But if you skip into the next chapter, Pilate actually answers his question. He gives you his definition, Pilate's definition of truth. So in chapter 19, starting in verse 9, He says, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? There's Pilate's definition of truth, by the way. Authority. Power. You know, that's another factor that emerges if you look at history simply as brute force, if you look at history without any motions of grace, what will emerge? Power struggles. Various fights and battles and wars and political fiascos all over who gets to call the shots. And this powerful statesman Pilate, that is his view. And he is in effect saying to the Lord of all creation, again, if Christianity is true, he is speaking to the word become flesh. And he says to him, don't you know that I call the shots? I have the power to release you or to crucify you. Talk to me. And then Jesus says, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. 
All of the factors that Pascal talks about are present in this remarkable scene. The external circumstances. The external circumstances involve the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. This is going to present a major crisis for Jesus' followers. Before he meets them after the resurrection, they are absolutely shaken to their very core. And again, here's what's so encouraging about Scripture. It doesn't hide the abject failure of Jesus' followers. Jesus never fails, but his followers screw up all the time. And that's why looking at Peter, who so often puts his foot in his mouth, on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, you see his real dark moment where he denies his Lord three times. None of that is hidden from us. And even later on, Peter still struggles. Paul has to call Peter out in the book of Galatians for nothing less than hypocrisy. We are dealing with a book that talks about human beings. All of those factors are there. The external circumstances are bleak and severe. And then look at the hardness of the heart. Even Pilate, who if you read some of the preceding verses here, is deeply shaken. He's shaken to his core. He gets real. It says that John tells us that he's afraid when he starts hearing that Jesus has called himself the Son of God. And remember, Pilate's wife have nothing to do with that righteous man. Which is why Jesus says to him, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Because he sees right into Pilate's heart. But the hardness of Pilate's heart causes him to clench his fist and say, I call the shots. I have power to release you or to crucify you. The hardness of the heart. The hardness of the heart of those out there who want to crucify him. The hardness of all of our hearts. What we're dealing with, whenever we resist Christ, whenever we resist his greatness, we don't want him to shatter our idols. We don't want to surrender to him. It's not easy. We have to die. When Christ calls a man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, he bids him come and die. But the motions of grace are present here too. It's amazing that in this moment, the darkest chapter in history, when an act of the greatest moral hideousness happens when the Lord of all creation, the righteous one, the spotless lamb, is crucified by his own creation, through that event will come about the redemption and the reconciliation of the world. The motions of grace intersecting, invading history. But this really happened. Christ came to this world and truly walked and truly lived and was truly crucified, dead and buried, and on the third day rose again. We are dealing with real history. We are dealing with true events. Our lives carry true significance. They're imbued with real significance. And yes, when we look at the church and we look at movements like evangelicalism, there are terrible flaws. There are terrible mistakes that are made. But those mistakes always happen, always, when we lose sight of our King and our Lord and get sidetracked. In the United States, this is a land of wonderful opportunities and freedom, but also a land filled with distractions and filled with seduction. And we have underestimated that seduction. And it is time, high time, for us to return our gaze to our Lord and focus on faithfulness to Him rather than relevance and engagement with the culture.